1,000 subs, that is amazing. And it's not something I thought I'd pass. So I'm amazed that so many people have watched my videos and actually clicked the button to say, I'd like to watch more of this. So thank you to everyone that's done that. I'm gonna create some more DIY electric piano videos very soon. Um, I've created the space to do that and I'm gonna make a lot more time for it. And I know that's the big thing, but please comment what you wanna see more of. Um, do you want to see more reviews, more pedals, more exploring other electric pianos? Um, I'm probably going to ignore it and just find what I find and make what I feel like, but yeah. I thought I'd do something different as a thank you video and I'd share the experience of the first time I've ever pressed a Fender Rhodes piano key. Now I'm from a small town between Yorkshire and County Durham and we used to have a few music shops and they stock like a few guitars and they're fairly good. But if you want like a, a set of spare strings, you could pop in there and get them the same day, which is really cool. Um, now we don't even have that ability, which is really sad because those shops are all gone. Um, later on, we did have sound control, which became reverb. And that was such a good shop to have locally, but there's a big void. So I really would like to see um, if anyone could move in. It'd be great if you had like a PMT here or something or like a guitar guitar. So once I finished college I got invited to an open day at the University of Leeds and this was a day where we could come into university and have a look around, talk to the lecturers and kind of get an idea of what it's about. So I spent a day at the physics department and me and my friend got a train up there and it was really cool. So after the open day we knew exactly what we were going to do we want to go and look at the guitar shops in Leeds. And I remember going into Hobgoblin and seeing a whole range of acoustic folk instruments as walls of violins and cellos. And it was really cool, off so much natural wood. And next door was Dr. Wu's. This is the first bar that I ever played in open mic night. And that's a story for another time, but that was really cool. I miss those places when I go back to Leeds. And across the road was Res Revolution. This was a vodka bar and this is the first bar I ever got paid to perform, that was really cool. And then next to it was a, a music shop called Music Ground. And this was, to me, it seemed like a fairly typical modern guitar shop. It stocked all the high end guitars, it had a great selection and it seemed like a good shop. You kind of went in, it had like a, a wall of Gibsons, Fenders, but it had a little, a little, uh, a little shop next door. So next door there was a glass door and you kind of opened it and you, didn't really know what was inside, just a staircase. And you kind of went up the staircase and at the top there was, a, there was a Vespa. And you're like, that's a bit weird. But inside this attic was just filled with classic vintage guitars. And these weren't like normal guitars. These were absolute like vintage gems. The kind where play amazing, look amazing. It's, it's what Murphy Labs try and recreate so much. So we spent an hour or so looking through there and the stock was so abundant like you couldn't move if you like tripped over and fell you could do like hundreds of thousand pounds worth of damage. There was like guitars from entire bands like a complete set of Burns guitars from the shadows. There was a lot of amazing acoustics, lap steels, Gibson pedal steels, a Hammond tone wheel organ. It was absolute dream. It's like if, if this was where I'd want to go to record something. So we ended up picking out like a 1970s Gibson ES-335, it had like a yellow sunburst, we played that and it was just so good, like we didn't have any money at the time, we were students and maybe we shouldn't have um, picked up the guitar at all, like you could argue that but I kind of see it as if you play these guitars you get appreciation of them and later you have the, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be able to afford them you can go back and, and buy them, you've created that relationship. And yeah, that guitar played so good. It's, it's what the guitar that, if I could go back in time, I, I would definitely want to play again and it would definitely make me part with some money. I don't even think it was that expensive. I'm sure it's probably about five times the cost now. But yeah, if that shop was around today, I'd be so much poorer. So I eventually actually went to Leeds and studied physics there. So while studying there, we spent three years and regularly, possibly once a week, once a month, we'd visit the music shops and we'd visit this 
museumatic and regularly see the stock in there and it was always seemed to be something new. To be honest, we'd rarely actually try a guitar, but sometimes we'd walk around and you see, I remember seeing like a 1950s Telecaster, a 1960s Stratocaster in its original case, and like a block inlay jazz master from the 60s. These guitars look so cool and they're so inspiring. Even just looking at them, never mind playing them. Like these were beaten, but sometimes we painted and beaten more. And each one seemed to have its own story. I remember one time going to the shop and there's on the floor was a Fender Rhodes stage model. It was a Mac 2 and it looked like, you know, it needed some love. The case was all scratched and battered, but that just means someone's enjoyed it, someone's gigged it, someone's took it around and shown it off and that's what these instruments are for. So for so long I've been in love with the magical sound of the Fender Rhodes and I couldn't resist it. I just had to press a key. I, I do this if I see like a, a synth I like, I'll press the key. And I'm sure you do the same. And I knew the action was going to be stiff. And it was. It was heavier than acoustic piano. And the stage model did not disappoint. But one thing that really surprised me, one thing that really blew me away was it wasn't plugged in. But when I pressed the keys, it still made a sound. And not only that, it was actually quite loud. And this was a time when the internet existed, but it, not everything was on it, or if it was on it, you couldn't always find it. And it just filled me with so many questions like, how, how did it make that sound? How does it do it without electricity? I thought this was an electric piano, I thought it needs electricity to do it somehow. How, how does it do it unplugged? There were so many questions. And it definitely didn't help my love for the electric pianos, because Look around, we've got a couple here. I'm lucky fortunate enough to, to have found some. And this was like in 2007, as I say, the internet wasn't what it was. And I'm sure, as I say, the information was out there, but I just, it was such a mystery, this machine. I was blown away that it worked acoustically. And I think next time I visited that shop, the piano was gone. And I visited the shop a few years later after studying. And I think the guitar shop was shut, but the glass door was open. So I walked inside like normal, and at the top of the stairs, there wasn't a Vespa, but just a dusty room. And the only instrument that I could see was like a Hammond that was in pieces. I didn't see anyone there, but I figured probably should leave. Now, <clears throat> if you do Google Music Ground, it does seem like the owners ran into some legal issues. Uh, partially probably from their own doing but I'm not really gonna go into that for me it, that was like a magical place where I went as a student and I'm definitely thankful for the opportunity that I got to kind of sneakily press some keys and fall in love even more with the Fender Rhodes piano but yeah I think that's it for this time but if you've enjoyed this I'd really want to know what it was like when you first experienced the Fender Rhodes piano if you put it in the comments or drop me an email, I'd love to know. But that's it for now.